pictured on best friends' walls, something pretty to look at before they went to sleep, to dream of romantic evenings in smoky clubs, smiling at slick-haired men dressed in sly smirks and pork pie hats. These photos of Marilyn Monroe made them feel like they had someone to look up to. Finally, an icon who looked more appealing than the people in their textbooks as she lay naked on Hugh Hefner's dirty sheets, dyed blonde hair, powdered cheeks, that alliteration of a name that looks so good imprinted on businessmen's pleats. It's so easy to agree with the idea of such a woman. But why do we waste our raving tongues and idealistic adjectives as names like Bella Abzug and Billie Jean King slip through our palms, ignoring the stories of women who never strip for success, whose faces aren't printed on the clothing in middle school hallways, whose wearers believe that the person they idolize will boost their amateur sex appeal? Revolutions are not made between supple breasts. They grow in the voices of women who test the limits of their allowances instead of allowing society to limit them of their voice. Women whose rough skin and crooked smiles were still photographed because their actions deserve to be recorded regardless of their hunched poise, beautiful for their working hands, their raised fists. And while Marilyn drowns in the photos of herself, society rejects her wrongdoings and rewrites the story of a country bumpkin who took Rosie's seat a woman made the men hard and the women harder, and when she left, we held on to her outlived name like parched dogs, licking our empty water bowls. A person's life can never be copyrighted. As soon as that tombstone acts as their headboard, we rewrite the truth to create idols for our children, convince ourselves that she made us stronger and name her a revolutionary, that she lived a broken life and name her innocent, that she scratched sweet nothings onto paper and name her a poet, Forget the name her mother gave her. Norma Jean Baker, you are not forgotten for your offenses. We look back to the 50s and beam at these sugary pinups, yet we stare at the women on today's playboys and label them trash. But if they swallowed their lives, maybe we'd label them heroes and shun the men who call to them like meat. Who are these hollowed beauties of whom we so fondly speak? Every man's dream but their own worst nightmare. Disregarding the pop portrait she was so pleased to pose for, the flash of the camera did not break her. She broke herself. And while we bow down to this face of naked photos, they dream to be hollow beauties. But when they awake from this fantasy of sexy Sunday nights, she will only be something pretty to look at before they go to sleep. Thank you. history, Maria was coveted by all of her village's men, who could never forget the way palm-warm tortillas dissolved in mouth like words on end of tongue, or how her embrace of summer dusk breeze drifted away from their fingertips. It was Fernando who won her, knowing just the right pressure in conversation and embrace to make her blush pink as evening primrose. The next day, she brought him tortillas. She placed the flower blanket over his tongue, and soon they were writhing like kneaded dough. Their children rose from her oven. But not long after, Fernando stopped eating her tortillas, stopped coveting her embrace. Maria smelled strangers' perfume on her husband and laundered in the river, cleansing clothes until the river water ran red the next laundry day. She pushed her children's tiny skulls under the water. She washed their pale bodies down a river of abandonment. Their bodies were found but not Maria. And when night covered sky, the townspeople said Maria would rise and come weeping along the river bank. Me see you! 
She was no longer Maria. She was Lyadona, the wailing woman. Today, Lyadona walks the streets. Our grandmothers are too scared to tell us of her new form, the white lady, no longer condemned to ditch banks or the tongues of our elders, but to newspaper headlines and cement walkways, she still takes children. Nathan Weatherfield walked the dark hallways of addiction. While sunshine hid behind the clouds until he no longer saw light, his mother never heard Lyadona's cries in a hospital emergency room. Lyadona watched along with Steve Paternoster as his 16-year-old daughter Haley fought for her last few breaths. The nurses pulled off her oxygen so that she would birth into the afterlife peacefully. Outside in the deep blue night, the nurses and orderlies swore they heard a woman's anguished cries, Me see! Lyadona is no longer a myth. She's being mass-produced on the streets. She prances away from the dirt-rough ditch banks and cement-mounted arroyos into the outstretched arms of lost children she believes are hers. It's no longer a legend when the two overdoses in 2006 turned to 17 by 2009. Lyadona beckons to them, to us. With arms open like a crucifix, she smiles as she begins to cry into them, her cottonwood branch body draining life fluid and lacing it with theirs. Their eyes glaze over and they nod into her addictive fingertips as she drowns them in her tattered white robe until the myth is the last thing they breathe. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, in April of 2010, Nathan Weatherfield and Haley Paternoster died of heroin overdoses. The black tar sat in Haley's sock drawer like coal in a child's stocking, branched through Nathan's veins like thunderstorms on spring days that steal the summer away. Lyona is real. The kids are hearing her cries, following the whines of Banshee Mother into goat head thorn patches or bathroom stalls, inviting her into the open embrace. Her hand is tightly encircled around their limbs. She is weeping, another lost child, floating down the creek face first into the desolate tributary, swallowing our state. Don't cover your ears. Listen. Me see her.